Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, birds, and we're going to go over some of the basic characteristics of birds and characteristics that certain groups of birds have. Uh, the last part of the unit, we're actually going to get in to learning specific birds, uh, some of the most common birds or most memorable birds of Missouri, uh, but that will come later on. So to start with, you know, birds are a class of animals, just like mammals, just like reptiles. Um, so this class is called aves, which is the uh, Latin word for bird. Um, these are archosaurs, which means it's an ancient, uh, ancient reptile. Um, but you don't really usually think of these as being reptilian because most of their anatomical characteristics have undergone changes uh, in order to lend themselves better to flight. Now we find birds in almost every single habitat um, all over the world. So open ocean, rainforest, right, deserts, and there are birds that live in caves. You remember the um, video that you guys watched with Alexander von Humboldt and how he, uh, he found the birds in the cave in um, Bolivia, I think. Um, some birds can dive, dive very, very deep in the ocean, up to 45 meters deep. So how deep is that? Well, that's probably, uh, what, 140 feet beneath the surface. So they, they live around the equator, but they can also visit the north and south poles. Um, and the very smallest bird is the bee hummingbird in Cuba, and it weighs just 1.8 grams. So uh, if you took two paper clips, that would be heavier than that one bird. And so, um, huge variation within this class of animals. Now, when we think of birds, obviously we're thinking of feathers and wings, right? So these are the most obvious adaptations. Um, and these are characters that have been derived from other other structures that were present in the ancestral forms. Uh, so first let's look at, uh, at the wings here. So the wings are just a modified arm and they have uh, the remnants of fingers from the ancestral claws. Of course, evolution has changed the, uh, the number and position of some of these fingers. Um, but they're still there. Uh, the bone structure is is very different than what we see in most mammals in that the bones are pretty much hollow and they're they're kind of uh, with all this cross cross membrane, they're very strong while also being very light and that's very important. Okay, if you look at the feather, I'm, I'm not going to make you guys learn all of these things, but the feather is composed of the shaft, which runs, um, goes into the flesh all the way out to the end. The wide portion of the feather is called the vein. So if you think of arrows, uh, you put the veins along the fletching. And these veins are made up of structures which are hooks and barbules. So these things kind of uh, hook themselves together and hold themselves. And if you've ever held a feather, you know that you can kind of um, pull it apart. And then if you uh, run your fingers across it just right, 
and you allow those hooks and barbels to uh, to come into contact again, then it's good as new. And so these feathers can kind of fix themselves a lot of times. So there were many types of dinosaurs that had feathers. However, they could not fly. So uh, the main purpose of fe the feathers that dinosaurs had was for insulation. So just like a nice down jacket insulates you, um, these feathers would insulate these dinosaurs as well and dinosaurs were warm-blooded we know this from the structure of their bones we know that they had feathers because we see the imprints of those within fossils and also um, another purpose was that these feathers could have colors on them that could be used to attract mates just like feathers on birds today So the forelimbs in almost all birds are adapted for flying, right? So the hind limbs are adapted either for walking, swimming, or perching. And so depending upon which it is, um, you can have differences in what the foot looks like, how it's structured. All birds nowadays have keratinized beaks. So what does that mean? Well. A Keratinized beak is a beak that has a lot of keratin in it. Keratin, uh, keratin is a protein, very tough protein. Think of uh, it's the same protein that makes up uh, snake scales, right? Or oops, sorry, or um, alligator skin, right? That's keratin. And then all birds are going to lay shelled amniotic eggs. So uh, no birds give live birth. You know, some snakes give live birth. Some snakes lay eggs. All birds lay eggs. So it's so kind of different there. Okay, so where did birds come from? So birds descended from theropods which were some small uh, carnivorous dinosaurs and this happened at least by 147 million years ago so think of you know dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago so birds and and the rest of the dinosaurs coexisted for quite some time so it's kind of a uh, somewhat of an ancient uh, lineage here. And you can see here, um, so these this would be like Brontosaurus, right? So very distantly related. And then as we get, like here's Velociraptor, Jurassic Park, Proto-Arcteryopteryx, Archaeopteryx, uh, the Paleognathus birds, like our ostriches, we call these ratites, kiwis, and then our, our new birds. All right, so here is kind of the oldest known bird. This is Archaeopteryx. And um, I believe this fossil was found in Germany, maybe? Um, originally, we've found many more of them. So, Archaeopteryx was very unique because it had uh, some some characteristics that were uh, more modern, but then it also had some very primitive characteristics. So, when we look at, um, obviously, it had wings. And they had feathers on the wings and feathers for the tail. Um, but it also had claws still on the wings. It had a bone, long bony tail uh, with feathers all around it. 
and um, it had it had teeth in it. You know, birds nowadays don't have teeth in their mouth, but this one did still. So a mix of modern characteristics and um, primitive characteristics. Here's the uh, famous fossil of Archaeopteryx. You can see its neck here, its head. Here's that long bony tail with the tail feather impressions. Here's the wing feather impressions with the clawed fingers still. Um, had abdominal ribs, which is a uh, fun fact. Most uh, most birds do not have ribs nowadays. Um, so it had uh, had a had a mix of things. Uh, we don't you don't need to know this one, so we're gonna skip that. All right, so let's start talking about some some living birds, okay? Uh, very important to know this word, ratite, okay? All ratites are going to be flightless birds. And these are the, the most primitive living birds are the ratites. The ratites are the ostriches, the emus, rheas, Kiwis and the Tinamus. What is the Tinamu? I don't know. You can look it up. Uh, these are uh, smaller. You can think of them as smaller versions of an ostrich. Everybody, know, everybody knows what an ostrich is. Uh, kiwi. You guys saw that the other day. Um, now these have a flat sternum, which is very important because these are flightless birds. Uh, uh, your the muscles of the breast or the chest attached to the sternum, and if you have to fly, you need large breast muscles, which means that you would have a keeled sternum. Uh, sternum. Think of it as uh, it goes up and down instead of side to side. So here we have in humans, for example. If you feel your sternum, which is that bone right in the middle of between your two sets of ribs, um, it's flat, right? We can't fly very well. Um, we're good at falling, not good at flying. We have a sternum just like the rat tights would because they don't fly either. Okay, all the other birds. Um, these are going to have a flexible palate. What does that mean? That means that the roof of their mouth is not firmly attached to a bone, right? It's not firmly attached to their skull. It can move around a little bit. Um, and because most birds have to fly, there's, there's a large degree of similarity across different groups of birds. So these flying birds are all going to have that keeled sternum that I was telling you about with well-developed pectoral muscles or breast or chest muscles. Now some birds had evolved flight, right? But then for different reasons lost the ability to fly. Um, so penguins, they still have wings. They don't fly in the air. But if you look at video of penguins swimming through the water, they are they are flying through the water. You know, they flap their wings and um, and they definitely fly through the water. They sw well, they swim. Um, there are flightless owls that that evolved in different places um, flightless pigeons like the uh, the dodo was a type of flightless pigeon um, different different flightless birds evolved 
Usually this happened on islands with a few predators. As you can imagine, not being able to fly has its limitations when there are uh, things around that can eat you. Okay, we uh, kind of already talked about this. So let's just quickly go over here with these feathers. So feathers have two main characteristics. They're lightweight. Featherweight, right? Means very light. Um, but they're also very tough. Think of uh, you know, a piece of paper versus a feather. A uh, feather can take a lot more of a beating than, uh, than a piece of paper. So the quill emerges straight from the skin. And then the, uh, the vein comes out from that. And once again, it's made up of a bunch of barbules and hooks here. They're kind of cross-linked together. And so they all kind of help support each other, which gives it um, that strength. But look at all the hollow spaces in here. That helps make it light as well. Okay, there are different types of feathers, um, and so we're going to talk about some of those. So contour feathers, these are vein feathers that cover and streamline a bird's body. So think of, if you look at, um, if you look at, let's just say a robin, right? So, you know, it has the dark feathers around its head and then it covers up the neck and then it seamlessly flows into the breast and onto the back and none of those feathers on the breast or on the throat of the robin or on the back of the neck none of those help it fly um, but they help streamline it help make it more aerodynamic as it flies through the air um, now if these feathers extend beyond the body like those on the wings and tail, then we call those flight feathers. Down feathers are um, very soft and they have no hooks on the barbel, so they don't uh, form these veins. They just kind of are little fuzzy feathers, and, and those are mainly for insulation. The phyllo plume feathers or what we see right here. Um, and these are kind of hair-like. Sometimes you, you hear these called pin feathers. Um, we don't know what these are for. Your guess is as good as mine. And then we have uh, powder down feathers, which um, kind of disintegrate as they grow. And this releases uh, agents that help them become waterproof. As you can imagine, uh, being waterproof has its advantages because you don't want that water to get underneath those feathers and chill the core of your body. So feathers, where did they come from? Well, they come from reptile scales. So um, with, with reptile scales, these things stay flat. With birds, instead of being flat, it rolls itself into a cylinder and then it grows up and out. If you've ever looked at a uh, cross section of uh, a pretty good sized feather, you can see it kind of rolls in on itself. And that's, it's just a, a feather, it's just a modified, super modified scale. That's all it is, which is pretty cool. We don't need to worry about all that. Okay, um, just like hair, feathers are made to grow and then they will fall out. Um, feathers are not alive. So as birds um, go to replace worn out feathers, they do what we call molt. And... Um, they don't, they don't like uh, lose all their 
feathers at once. Like you've never seen a completely naked uh, robin hopping around in your yard. They, you, they lose a few feathers here, a few feathers there. And so you, you always see random feathers uh, going around. It doesn't necessarily mean that that bird died. It just meant, you know, it just lost a feather. Um, now, for, um, for these flight feathers and tail feathers, they're usually going to be lost in pairs. So if you're the third feather from the end on the wing on one side and you go, then that same feather on the other side is going to go as well. And that's to maintain balance as you're flying around. Um, so kind of neat. And when you, you see that, uh, if you see buzzards or hawks or something and they've lost one, check it out. A lot of times you'll see that on the other side, they've lost the same feather. Okay, so we know that birds come in many different colors, and um, and these colors can be pigmentary or structural. And so I'll tell you guys the difference. So um, there are pigments, which are chemical substances that absorb certain colors of light and reflect other kinds of light and so those are um, you don't need to know the difference between lipochromes and melanin just know that um, some colors are caused by pigments but for example blue you think of the blue bird or the blue jay um, if you look at those blue jay feathers under the microscope they are in fact brown. If you hold them up in front of the window, they are blue. If you get confused, you look at it under the microscope again, it's as brown as, use your imagination. Um, so why is it blue when you look at it, you know, with, with natural light? It has to do with the actual, uh, structure of the feather itself, the way the hooks and barbules come together are so fine that it actually scatters light to produce short wavelengths of light, which are blue wavelengths. So it's actually, uh, it's actually scattering the light that hits it. Not, not that it's got that color embedded within the, uh, the feather itself. Okay, we talked about uh, this briefly. So the skeletons of birds are, are, they need to be very lightweight, but they need to be strong too, because, you know, flapping those wings, that's a lot of stress on them. So we see that the uh, cavities of bird bones are filled with air. That helps make them lightweight. These cross-linking things here help give it some strength. All right. Um, so the uh, ancestors of birds had diapsid skulls, um, which means that they were composed of mainly two parts. Bird skulls are mainly going to be fused into one, one big piece. Um, the leg bones on birds are typically going to be denser and heavier, and that helps keep, it's kind of like a keel on a boat, right? The keel is usually filled with lead or iron or something like that. Helps keep it stable and uh, give it aerodynamic stability. Now, modern birds, as opposed to like Archaeopteryx and some of our other um, more ancient kinds of birds, modern birds are toothless. We said they have that keratinized beak. They also have kinetic skulls, which means that uh, their palate, we said it's not firmly attached. So that means that 
they can really open their mouth up wide. And anyone who's seen a baby bird uh, trying to eat uh, can attest to that fact. Uh, obviously, you don't need to learn all this, um, but here's that keeled sternum. So all along the surface area, um, all along that surface area, you're going to see the uh, flight muscles attach. All right, so early birds were carnivorous. Most birds, uh, well, I'm not going to say most birds. So most early birds were carnivorous. Um, they fed on insects or smaller uh, arthropods, stuff like that. And a lot of birds still are. Um, other birds will just eat uh, nectar from flowers or just eat berries or seeds or uh, like ocean birds will just eat fish, you know, so different species specialize in eating different things. Some are generalists, so they feed on lots of different things. Others feed on just one type of food, and those are specialists. So the uh, advantage of being a specialist is you don't have as much competition, but if something happens to that food source, you're kind of, uh, you're in trouble. Whereas generalists, you know, they got to compete with all kinds of other birds. But if something happens to one food source, there's probably going to be another food source that they can utilize. Based upon how they feed, um, that's, that's related to the type of bill or beak that a bird is going to have. And so here we see uh, some generalized beak types. And so we see that the raven, which eats, you know, almost anything, has a very generalized type of beak. Whereas the cardinal, you know, its job, if you want to try cardinals, you put out sunflower seeds, right? So it's good at cracking open seeds. It's got this uh, relatively short, uh, but that makes it a kind of a powerful beak. This American avocet, it's got a upturned uh, beak, and this is made to probe into the mud looking for worms. The pelican, of course, is a big dip net. You've got the mud sifting flamingos, the nut cracking parrots, fish spears, the anhinga or water turkey, and then, of course, everyone knows that eagles have that hooked beak for uh, tearing into meat. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the inner workings of birds. Um, at the end of their esophagus, um, most birds have what is called a crop. Uh, and the crop is used for storage. So if you think about it, you know, birds, uh, they can't like carry stuff around in their, uh, in their hands as they they can't gather up a bunch of food and like carry it in their arms and, and run back they have to store it someplace and so they store it in their crop uh, the stomach's got a gonna have two parts so the first once it gets itself the food makes its way to the stomach the first is going to secrete the gastric juices the second is called the gizzard, and you guys have probably heard this before. Um, the gizzard is going to have some scaly plates in it that is going to, and it's, it's very muscular, and it's going to grind up the food after it's been soaking in those gastric juices. Some birds are going to swallow small stones. Um, to help that gizzard grind it up, just like we use millstones to grind wheat into flour so that it's easily uh, digestible to us. Birds uh, do the same things. Dinosaurs even did this. Um, you'll often find birds hanging around uh, gravel parking lots. Uh, I, there's no food there. They're there eating little bits of, uh, of 
gravel that aid in their digestion. Doves do that a lot. Uh, sometimes what the bird eats, it can't digest at all. And so, for example, owls will cough up um, owl pellets and you can look through those and uh, kind of figure out what that owl had to, had to eat. Okay, so let's talk about the circulatory system. Like mammals, birds are going to have a four-chambered heart. Um, they're going to have a relatively fast heartbeat, and the smaller the bird is, the faster the heartbeat is going to be, but that's the same thing for uh, mammals too. Unlike with mammals, the red blood cells in, um, in birds are going to have a nucleus, and they're biconvex, which means they're kind of shaped like a flying saucer. Um, they, they don't look like mammal blood cells. Um, so, for respiratory system in birds, what you need to know is that um, when birds are flying, right, that's a lot of aerobic activity. You, you need a lot of oxygen for that. So the respiratory system is going to be adapted so that they can get the high metabolic demands of flight. Um, and, and what they have is they have these parabronchi. So when, when birds are flying, uh, air is always being rushed through their lungs. Unlike with us, the, it dead ends in these alveoli. Uh, with birds, it doesn't do that. They have totally different lung structure. And so when birds are flying, they literally cannot run out of breath. Um, they can run out of energy. They can like literally fall out of the air because they ran out of energy, but it's never because they didn't have enough oxygen. Just kind of some uh, interior uh, views of that. Look at all this extra airspace here. All right, you don't need to know all that. All right, let's talk about the excretory system. So, um, there is only one exit for a bird. Um, so, they don't have a bladder like what we have. So they secrete waste as uric acid. And, um, and some marine birds will excrete extra salt um, through some salt glands. Um, and just literally the extra salt drips right off the nostril. It's quite bizarre. The nervous system of birds is heavily involved for um, being able to uh, coordinate their balance and also for uh, supreme optic abilities. Most birds have extremely poor sense of smell and taste. Um, not all birds, but most birds have very poor smell and taste. Um, but they have extremely good eyesight and oftentimes very good hearing. And this is kind of cool. A hawk can see a crouching rabbit a mile away. No problem. Um, so to, to fly, obviously birds must generate lift forces greater than their own mass. But just doing that will just allow them to like hover. So they also need to provide propulsion in order to not only overcome gravity, but move forward. So that's what these bird wings are for. And you can look at the uh, shape of a bird wing 
and figure out um, kind of probably what habitat it lives in, kind of what kind of life it has. So the first are these elliptical wings. Okay, um, these elliptical wings are very good for maneuvering in forest where all of a sudden, whoa, there's a branch that you have to zip around. This makes you uh, highly maneuverable. Okay. Now, some birds um, either make long migrations or they are going to feed during flight and they need high speed wings. And so they're going to have the swept back design, very slender tip, no wing slots like you see over here that aid in maneuverability. Uh, this is about speed and efficiency. And of course, swallows and purple martins and birds like that that feed in the air are great examples of those type of, of wings. And, you know, for those of you into planes, um, you can see a lot of the same types of structures for wings, different kinds of, you know, aircraft. So this makes you think of, right, like a, a fighter attack plane, whereas this would be like a, a F-4 Corsair during World War II, very maneuverable. This would be like a U-2 spy plane, where it's made to uh, stay aloft for a long period of time with a lot of lift. So these dynamic soaring wings, these are used um, just to stay stay up in the air because there's always wind blowing over the sea and they can stay, stay aloft with just the slightest amount of wind. And then of course uh, the hawk wings here kind of looks a little bit like an elliptical wing, um, but they're much bigger than that. And these are ones that that have to carry bigger loads. All right, so um, one one characteristic that a lot of birds uh, have in common with each other is that some species of birds undergo very long migrations. Some do the migration very quick. Others take their time, they feed along the way. Um, they use a variety of different uh, mechanisms in order to make a successful migration, but they do follow landmarks. They follow rivers, they follow the coastline, they follow mountain ranges. Um, so here we see uh, the bobolink, which lives, uh, they don't live in Missouri, but they live you know, north of here. Um, they nest around the Great Lakes, and then they go down and hang out in uh, in Argentina in the winter. You know that's it's quite quite the trip. Or the uh, the American golden plover. You know, look, it's it's all the way up in northern Canada, watching out for polar bears, and then it comes all the way down here to Uruguay. So it's quite the trip that some of these species make. Um, the the cause for migration probably has to do with uh, the hormone levels that change brought about by a change in day length. And if you've ever raised chickens, you know that uh, they don't lay eggs unless there's a certain amount of light uh, that, that hits them. Uh, some birds, like we said, use uh, visual cues uh, somehow they have this accurate sense of time. Uh, some birds have little iron deposits in their brains, which may help them detect the Earth's magnetic field. And believe it or not, uh, they can look at stars as they fly along at night, too. It's crazy. All right, uh, mating systems. So some birds are monogamous. Uh, where one individual has a mate. Uh, in most animals, this is very rare, but it is common in birds, actually. Um, what, sometimes they're just monogamous for one year. Sometimes they're monogamous for the rest of their life. Oops. 
Okay. Do, 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 do. So why why is it uh, advantageous to be monogamous if you're a bird? Well, um, you have twice as much help when you're trying to take care of the hatchlings. That's why. Uh, the other type of system is polygamy, where an individual has more than one mate during a breeding season. Uh, this can be polygyny, which is one male, many females. Um, think of um, like the bull in a herd of cows. Or polyandry, where you have one female and many males compete for that one. Uh, I'm not really going to get into this. Uh, um, so there's there's some species that have what's called a lek, which is like a display area where males gather around and uh, you know, it's the females can kind of go around and look at that one and this male and you know, oh, maybe I like this one and and uh, you know, that's just, just their system. Uh, we won't worry about this. Uh, nesting. Um, yeah, so birds have all kinds of different nests. Some put a lot of effort into it, some don't. Um, Usually they're going to try to hide the nest or put it somewhere where it's inaccessible to predators. Different kinds of uh, hatchlings. So uh, the precocial young are ones that are covered with down whenever they hatch and they can like run and swim uh, as soon as that those down feathers dried. Um, they still need to be taken care of by the parents for a while. It's not like they hatch and be like, later, fellas, and take off. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so think of like baby chicks, right? The other kind is what you see that falls out of the nest in, of a tree in your front yard. The ultracol, uh, which are naked, they can't see, they can't walk, they're totally helpless. Uh, parents have to put a lot of energy because this thing can't move, right? It's got to keep going back to the nest and shoving worms in its mouth. Um, and then, of course, there's species that are somewhere in between. All right, so we flew through that kind of fast. Uh, you can go back and listen to this uh, over if you dare. Um, I kind of highlighted what's important to know as we went through this, and that's it.